welcome to season two of Run Chat Live. Um, it's been 49 days actually and counting since season one ended in um, the culmination of an actual real life conference in Brighton with the RCL International Running Conference. Um, that uh, I just have to say thank you again to the speakers for coming along, to all of the delegates who came along. Um, it truly was a fantastic event. It surpassed all my expectations. Um, I knew it was going to be great because the speakers that were there, but it was uh, it was wonderful. It was just great seeing all the speakers together. It was great seeing the delegates have a chance to meet the, the speakers in, in flesh. Because, um, uh, you know, like I said at the conference over and over again, I, obviously I'm a podcaster, so I, I love the ability to communicate with people on the internet, but I do worry that it's all becoming very much that and we're losing that personal contact. So it was fantastic to see the audience and the speakers being able to interact with the other in real life. I mean, look at that photo, for example. Those of you who are watching the YouTube, watching live, um, what a lovely shot this is. Look at that with all the speakers there sitting on the table. Um, so we've got Paul Coker, we've got Christopher Johnson, we've got Simon Bartold there, uh, we've got Derek Griffin, Ian Griffiths, uh, we've got uh, Jack Chu, uh, we've got Mike James there, Izzy Moore. It was just a fantastic, fantastic event, JF Esculia. Um, it was lovely. And some of these people hadn't even actually seen each other before. They hadn't met or shaken hands, even though they'd kind of been talking on the internet for up to five, ten years. They never had a chance to shake each other's hands. So, yeah, I felt pretty damn good about myself um, in bringing these people together and giving people a chance to see them so good news is we're already planning for next year uh, should be around the same time so um around end of october again on a thursday friday i think it would be i'm thinking potentially of doing another one on the weekend as well maybe in the north of england because there was a few people who couldn't travel down or could only come on a weekend so anyway if you're interested in staying in touch then um maybe sub subscribe to runchatlive.com that's the best thing or follow us on social media it all goes out there but um, yeah, uh, the videos, oh, look at that, Christopher Johnson, Derek Griffin, another photo, classic. Bringing those two together, just seeing them, I thought, stop there, you two, I've got to take a photo. It was classic, brilliant. What a great meeting of two humongously important minds to the world of running. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, if you want to, all the presentations, the 10 presentations and two question times are available um, online at um, www.runchatlive.com. Um, you can watch the whole lot with something I've packaged as the whole experience. You can just get day one, just get day two. You can even buy them individually. Um, so, yeah, if you just want to see them again or you didn't make it around this time, or you didn't catch the virtual live, you can see all these presentations are all available for you. Um, there's also um, a Facebook group, which was actually where it was put out virtually, which I've left open now because it's become a great hot pot for runners and clinicians um and also so yeah if you want to go to that facebook group then um again access is available at runchatlive.com and also yes a few people saw the t-shirts which i was wearing and the event team and uh well yeah you asked and and i supplied so the t-shirts were also now available in men's and ladies fits again on the website um and they're yeah being bought at a rate that does surprise me um having my ugly mug um, on your chest, um, like Courtney has here from gatehappens.com. Um, fantastic Courtney from Gate Happens. It's, I mainly follow them on Instagram, um, but a great website as well. And Courtney was uh, wonderful enough to not only get one of these t-shirts, but also model it fantastically there. Um, so yeah, t-shirts are available, guys, if you fancy them. Uh, just a shout out before we start with today's guest uh, to Brighton Beer Company. Uh, .co.uk, who are still hosting, or not hosting, sorry, sponsoring their website. Um, a little bit of a shorter beard, for those of you who are watching the video, you can see, but still magnificently groomed, thanks to these guys at brightonbeardcompany.co.uk. Um, still addicted to their Alfriston uh, balm, but there's a whole range of essences of balms and oils and brushes and bags and all sorts of stuff there. So if you haven't checked them out yet, there is still a 15% discount. If you use the code RCL15, then you can get 15% discount off any of the products at the Brighton Beard Company.co.uk. So, yeah, do check them out. Um, fantastic. Right. I think that's all of the things I needed to say before the most exciting part of today, which is going to be our first guest 
for season two. I'm still calling it episode 37. But as you may have seen, I'm sure you have seen uh, in the advertising over the last week or so, um, I have probably gone overboard. But I'm, uh, one, I'm so excited about being into bring this guy to you. And two, um, it's just a fantastic opportunity for you to hear from the man himself. Um, those of you who aren't aware of Matt Fitzgerald, um, you probably have seen his stuff. If you look at any articles online, then you probably have seen him in uh, magazines like Competitor, in Triathlon, in Men's Health, in Running Fitness, all over the place. Um, many of you probably have his books. The book that hooked me initially was Brain Training for Runners back in 2006, I believe it was. Check my crib sheet. No, 2007. Um, that book still for me is a Bible of anybody who's trying to get past the whole idea of injury being in the knee and the foot. Um, Matt, for me, was ahead of the game. He was fantastically ahead of the game in introducing us to the whole fact that the, the brain is the defender. The brain is the one that's uh, sending out sensations of fatigue and pain. Um, it's not coming from our knees or ankles at all. So we do need to take into account factors that are affecting the brain. Um, the same way as when you see the finish line, you speed up at the end. Suddenly you've got that energy. It's not the physiological thresholds which are stopping you. Um, it is the brain because it is some of the information it's receiving that's stopping you. So change something like visual uh, input. You can see the finish line and bam, we've all been there. Suddenly you're sprinting across the line. Same thing goes uh, with uh, pain as well. The way that pain can come and go depending on sensory input. Um, that whole idea where you don't even start feeling pain until you see the blood trickling down your forehead in the mirror, that sort of thing. But it's a hugely massive book and it really timed well with me at that particular period of my career back in 2007 when being introduced to whole kind of biopsychosocial input and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I, I totally say that everybody who looks after runners should have that book on their shelf. But there was more since then. For those of you who aren't quite old as me, uh, Run Faster was a classic book um, Matt and Brad Hudson produced from 5K to marathon distance um, using concepts from brain training for runners but yeah just some fantastic coaching tips and some wonderful examples in the back it's probably my bible for giving people um coaching programs and things um other books you might have heard the 80 20 running i mean everyone's talking about it now the idea that you should be operating 80 percent of your training at a low to moderate intensity and saving 20 percent for that high intensity matt was talking about it and going on about it back in 2014 um, which is already five years ago, crazily enough. But yeah, if you want to see where it all came from, then then Matt's 80-20 running and also an 80-20 for triathletes as well, which came out later that year, is very much worth checking out. Uh, How Bad You Want It, built again on the uh, importance of psychological motivation and input in achieving your goals. Um, Diet Cults, because Matt's also a nutritionist, was a fantastic book. Again, he's so research-based, Matt is um that's the thing about matt i mean he's got those three triangles which just makes for somebody very special in that one he's a great journalist i mean the the words he uses the way he puts things together is is fantastic two he's very much evidence-based he loves the research he is always checking out the latest knowledge um but three um is he's also a great runner i mean um, recently i think a couple of years ago he managed to beat his uh, PB for a marathon by two minutes, but that was a PB which he set nine years ago. So he beat his PB from nine years ago at the age of 47. And actually, there's a new book coming out, which we'll probably talk about on the podcast coming up, uh, which is about the training he did for that uh, to get his uh, new PB, um, which is, is something incredible. Um, at 47 years old, um, let me just get the correct time for you, which it was, because I mean, it's just hope for me completely. Where was he? Yeah, 217, 46 years old, Chicago Marathon, which is a very competitive marathon. And there he is getting 239, 30, 47, 46 years old. You know, his PB behind there was two minutes um, slow and that was set nine years before. So, yeah, yeah, putting his principles into effect. So, yeah, those three things together make Matt a very special person. And I'm hugely excited to be able to bring him to you today. Um, the Endurance Diet, another book. The other angle which we're going to be talking about, especially today, is his latest book, Life is a Marathon, where Matt takes um, a huge, huge change in his normal writing 
in the fact that he shares 10 years of his life since meeting his partner and now wife, um, Nataki. Um, and essentially the struggle they had in, in, in dealing with her eventual diagnosis of uh, bipolar disorder. Um, it's a book that will shock you considerably. It's a real eye opener. The way that Matt and Nataki share um, what they went through in the periods of instability and, and, and violence and, and sheer horror is incredible. Um, it's amazing that those two have opened up, but it's all done in the name of helping other people know about mental health and, and how we deal with it. But also the book is divided up. Every other chapter is Matt's uh, a challenge he was doing at the time of 10 marathons in eight marathons in eight weeks. Um, so he's also through giving a commentary on various marathons around the United States, people he's meeting whose life have been affected by running. Um, and there's some wonderful characters um, and so the title Life as a Marathon is both about his own experience in in uh, saving the relationship and, and basically saving his own life and his partner's life um, by sticking with it, by being the endurance athlete he is. And also the the way that running has saved others' lives and the motivation it, it, um, for getting to running in the first place. So we will be talking very much about that. It's a hugely significant book that I can't stress enough. You buy it you will read it in five days. I had the audible version and I couldn't, any opportunity I had with the earphones in, um, I, I was there listening to it. It really is glued to it completely. So I do stress, we'll put a link in the notes. Um, you want to book over Christmas or something, that is the one to go for. So there we go, quite a long intro, but um, it's a big it's a big guest. It's a big guest here to start off uh, season two of Unchat Live. So I will give a five second countdown. And I sincerely hope you enjoy um, an hour or so's chat with the one and only Matt Fitzgerald. Yeah, so, you know, Nataki and I met on a blind date in 1997, um, and I wrote about that date shortly after it happened. Um, because a as a writer, I mean, it's just in my blood and anytime I have intense experiences, I, I, I want to write about them. So I was actually writing about us from the get go. Um, you know, there's a scene in the book where, uh, I take Nataki to my home state of New Hampshire. Uh, Nataki is African-American. I grew up in the whitest state in, of all 50 <laughs> in the United States. So there's a, there's a scene there that's from early in our relationship where she meets my dying grandmother and there's just a beautiful moment there. I wrote about that almost right after it happened. And um, so I, I was always writing about us, but I didn't know our story would take the hard left turn it did after we'd been married for a couple of years and Nataki was diagnosed with, with bipolar disorder. Um, and so when we were going through that, and that was a full decade of really being in a, a pretty bad place. And, you know, that sort of put a kibosh on any plans I had to write about us for public consumption because we did, you need your happy ending, right? Um, so after we sort of kind of came through the storm, um, that's when we started to uh, talk about kind of sh sharing. Um, and of course it had to be both of us because it's both of our, I'm the writer. Uh, but it's both of our lives that we're going to be put on paper um, for public scrutiny. So, yeah, it was a long process and certainly there was no real plan uh, to it. It just it ended up where I think it needed to. Yeah, definitely. I mean, was there I'm, I'm curious how much resistance was there? Because what, all I know about Nataki is what you the picture you painted, which incidentally is like I think I fell in love with it. Like you say, with the uh, that, that scene with with. Dorothy, was it your grandmother? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the the way that scene worked out when no one was talking to this precious old lady in Nataki just kind of like goes straight up and goes, hey, do you want to eat this? And I was like, <gasps> she was like eating solids or, and yeah, and the whispering. And then there was that whole, I mean, you can't get away from it. There is that humor of the whole kind of clash of the black and white culture thing. And, and uh, but yeah, so, and the many moments in the book where you do, we feel so much for Nataki, you, you paint such a beautiful picture of her 
and her being a, um, I think you describe as a healer or a giver at some point. And so when these things do happen, it's uh, it's straight away, although it's shocking, we want it to have a happy ending from the beginning. We, we, we are on her side and your side so much by then. But how much resistance, I'm curious, was there initially on her behalf of saying, you know what, I'm not quite sure I need people to know about certain things that we went through? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a one of the, one of the things that's tough about mental illness is that it affects your mind, right? Which controls everything. Um, so th that's why you know, there's a stigma attached to mental illness, whereas there isn't, you know, with heart disease or, or di diabetes. Um, and also, you know, it, it you just experience it in a very different way than other diseases. You know, one of the sort of ironic symptoms of bipolar disorder is something called anosognosia, which is the inability to actually recognize that you're sick. <laughs> so it was five years from diagnosis to the time that Nataki would actually allow anyone to say she had a, a mental illness. So there's five years right there. So that we were still a long way from being able to share our story publicly. Um, but the real difference maker was when Nataki finally gained lasting stability. And she, she felt like at, at that point um, she could, you know, because she is a healer. So when she got to a point where she felt like sharing her story uh, could be beneficial to other people, um, then, then she, it's something that she not, not only stopped resisting, but very much wanted to do and, and encouraged me to do. Yeah. No, I, from the, again, the picture you've painted, of, I expect no less. It's amazing. Well, it's both of you. I think the book is testimony to your relationship and, and, and that you've managed to produce um, such a, such an honest uh, sharing of what you went through. Um, before we go into some, I think it's so important for people before they hear about some of these traumatic scenes, some of the humor, I mean, like I said, offline, if, if you're not fed up with the writing and the articles and the magazines and the running and the everything, stand up is waiting for you. <laughs> Joe Rogan or something. That's something else. Have you not? I, I'm quite a fan of Joe Rogan podcast. I'm surprised you haven't been on that yet. Do I need to kind of send him an email or something? Or is there anything in there? Uh, that, that would be fun. Uh, it, others have brought it up. Um, I think I might have tried to uh, bait him with a tweet at one point, but, uh, you know, uh, it hasn't happened, happened yet. You're fitting great. I'll have to uh, see. If, I've got one contact. I'll see if I can hook you up with him. <laughs> it's me hooking Matt Fitzgerald up with you. Anyway, so, um, Appreciate it. It's, um, yeah, I mean, some of the humor in the book, you write so wonderfully, your observational stuff. To give an idea... I'd like you, and you can take as long as you want, to describe the visit you had to the Black Biker Club. Um, and I want you to in particular mention the character Antoine, call me Harley, and what ended up on the dance floor. Um, and all the way, talk, talk us through to the ending where the guy came back to you. And yeah, tell us about it, because it's brilliant. Yeah, so, you know, Nataki grew up in, uh, in Oakland, California, which is, it's a, you know, majority minority city. Um, I actually visited, she was living with her mom. She was just 22 years old when we met on that blind date. And so I visit, I actually, we stopped by. She wanted to, once she decided I was safe, she wanted to change clothes for the rest of the, our date. So I stopped by her house and, you know, it was, I had never been to a neighborhood like that. So um, it's difficult to overstate how different our backgrounds were. We grew up on, she's a city girl, she's black, I'm white, I'm a country boy. We're from opposite sides of the country. She grew up with religion. I didn't, you know, up and down the line, it's like, how this is, how is this going to work? So especially early on in the relationship, we had a lot of cross-cultural experiences, which for the most part were great uh, because we're, we're both, obviously we were together for a reason. We were both open to those sorts of experiences. And uh, yeah, early on, she she has a, a she, her best friend at the time was a guy named Antoine, uh, who's gay. And um, he, uh, <laughs> and it's just a very flamboyant, almost like a caricature type of character. I describe his laugh in the book, you mentioned it offline, as uh, like, like Popeye the Sailor Man's only three octaves higher. Um, 
and just you know just the, the kind of person the kind of person like even if you love him you warn people about him before they meet him for the first time so he had this invitation to uh, a biker bar there's, there's a black motorcycle club in oakland all black um and antoine invited nataki and nataki extended the invitation to me i wasn't going to say no i i was a little frightened at the prospect um but i didn't want to this was part of the my whole process of working to overcome my perception of myself as a coward. So this was, this was gonna be good for me. So yeah, we went to the club um, and I, I was the only white person in the club. Um, it's pretty much the scene, exactly the scene you would have imagined. Um, a lot of leather, uh, a lot of rap music and, uh, and it didn't take, and, and Nataki was a stunner. She was actually modeling at, at the time. So very beautiful woman. So the only guy walks in with the most beautiful woman <laughs> and someone was going to challenge me. And that's what ended up happening. We'd, we'd only just started dancing together when some, he was clearly underage. I don't even know what he was doing there, but um, long story short, yeah, he challenged me and I had to step up um, and a fight broke out. Uh, it was broken up quickly, which is fortunate for me. He had two friends with him and, and Antoine, Antoine actually could throw down, but he, you know, he, you can toss away that stereotype, but, but he was nowhere to be seen when I needed him. Um, and yeah, I wasn't hurt, but it was, uh, it was, uh, now yeah, something I'll never forget. Yeah, that's for sure. And hopefully makes an entertaining scene in the book. Oh, it's, it's even now I'm crying just thinking about <laughs> describing. I mean, talk about throwing yourself. And I love the way you, you link it to this one, this this burning thing that happened to you when you decided to put out from the running. It's like I have to prove myself. So I'm going to go with a gay guy to a black bike club video <laughs> there with the most beautiful girl on my arm and just see. What happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Made perfect sense. It. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever make a movie, oh, Jim Carrey's a bit past it now, but we need someone. I mean, it's just a classic movie. Thing. <laughs> but in the end, the guy came up to you, didn't he? Was that? I think in the book you describe how the guy came up to you later on, and actually. Yes, of... yeah, it's funny, yeah, because I did stand my ground, um, and yeah, he. So the party resumed, um, and then the same guy who challenged me before uh, came came back up to us, and I thought, here we go again. Uh oh, um, but he actually uh, just uh, uh, just gave me a gesture of respect. Uh, I, I had earned his respect. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah, there's so much in this book to wake people up and just, it's brilliant. But the reason I think it's so important for people who haven't read the book to realize that these stories and more um, happen and then suddenly it all turns very, very dark and different. Um, and it's that juxtaposition of the emotions which makes it such um, uh, an incredible book. I mean, so from that, for example, just to give a, an example of it, that, on the timeline, I don't think they happen necessarily together, but the one that um, really got me was the the day, I can't remember which chapter it was, but where it ended up basically with Nataki in a car, round and round about, police got involved. Tell us through that, I think it's as much or as little as you want, just to give an idea of how that such a happy, fantastic, multicultural time could turn into poof, reality of struggling with someone with mental health problems. Yeah. So, you know, uh, bipolar disorder manifests differently. You know, it has one name, but it, it, it manifests differently in each individual. And for Nataki, uh, it manifested in violence to a certain extent. I, I say, I hesitate to say, thankfully, always directed against me because it, it actually would have been worse if it were, you know, indiscriminate or, um, you know, God forbid, directed against children or whatever. It was always directed at me. But um you know, there, we, I had some, there were some scary moments, um, and, and a lot of them, um, and this went on for a very long time. And so the, 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 the episode you're thinking of was, um, 10 years into it, uh, near, nearly a full decade, um, post-diagnosis, uh, she had a, a, a psychotic break, um, and, uh, came after me when I was naked in the bathtub um and actually you know what i'm mixing up two days these things happen close on close one on one on the other the the, the the other one actually uh started outdoors um and i kind of fled 
Um, I, I was actually arrested and put in jail the one time I fought back. Um, so I learned that I can't fight back. <laughs> um, so yeah, she, I, I ended up sort of fleeing on foot and she, she got in one of our vehicles and tried to track me down uh, and run me over with it. Um, and there was a, I, I did have my cell phone with me. I always seem to somehow have my cell phone with yeah. me. That was like, I, I might not be here otherwise. Um, but I, the police were summoned and then um, there was a, a very close shave. Nataki nearly got herself shot uh, by the police a couple of times. And this was one of those times. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, the, the drama of it, it's just, you, you can't believe it's happening. It, it felt like war. It, I mean, it really did just like, you know, you just, I mean, you're so in the moment that it just, it's surreal, but it's all, all too real. And then you only after word, can you kind of process it and just ask yourself, what the what was that? <laughs> I can only imagine that people who can actually identify this with being either the person trying to help somebody else or the person actually suffering what this must mean to them if they do hear you sharing these experiences in terms of i'm not the only person that happens to other people people are learning about it it's not a hidden thing or kind of gossip behind closed doors um so yeah i'm sure that i mean have you had any feedback from people who have been in similar circumstances on either end with regards to it's so nice that you're actually shown this as a couple? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the responses have been, um, you know, I, I expected a certain amount of uh, sort of counter sharing, you know, people uh, being moved by the book and then opening up because I saw that um, the, the book uh, has two narrative threads. One describes a cross country trip that Nataki and I took together where I ran marathons all over the place. That's the sort of running part of the book. And at that point I was sharing our story. This is before the book was published, but it was, it was this journey was undertaken for inclusion in the book. So even when I shared this stuff verbally with, with strangers, I would just land in a town, put a, a call out on Twitter or Facebook, run with a stranger the next morning, tell my story and then I would get stuff back, you know, from that person because everyone's been through something. Um, and so I saw what it was going to be like even before the book came out. And then the book brought that to, to the next level. And sometimes it wasn't just strangers uh, opening up, but people I knew or had known uh, acquaintances, but I didn't know their story. And so those were some of the most touching moments for me, you know, when it was someone who, I knew, you know, but had been keeping stuff private and until, you know, reading my book made them feel comfortable, uh, you know, sharing that stuff with me. Um, so yeah, it's been gratifying. I'm sure that means the world to Nataki as well when she kind of gets that sort of feedback. Um, yes. Yeah. Cause I can only imagine she must feel like she's got everything to lose and so little to gain, but when she gets that feedback, it must be very warming for her. I'm sure. Um, yeah, so like I say, there's, there's, that's just an example of one of the sudden things that happens. And there's some shocking moments in there. I think I mentioned your affair. I don't know. I'm just saying this because I'm wondering whether other people who read the novel as well have the same feeling. But sometimes I felt this kind of almost guilt of, because the way it's written is such, it would be such a good novel, a thriller, because the way it's written and, uh, and, obviously that's you can't help that it's your life it's the way things you know unravel themselves and it's the way you paint the characters with such warmth and truth that you're emotionally involved you know really is a cliffhanger of a novel uh but sometimes I'm, i get that sensation of wow I'm turning the page i'm so excited what happens does she kill him or not and it's like <laughs> gone this is someone's life it's someone who i've admired and respected for ages. i should be having this kind of weird feeling but is that something when you read it back or listen to people describing it that you're aware of, of, of how thrilling a ride it is for people does that take it away or does it add to it or something that you're aware is bound to happen with this sort of book yeah i mean i i read a lot of memoirs myself and and people typically i mean unless it's a celebrity people typically don't write a memoir unless they've been through something dramatic right you know because a, a book is in addition to everything else a commodity um and and people but they want something out of it when they when they purchase it. So there are plenty of people who might have had experiences like mine and would have just decided that needs to stay private. <laughs> um, but 
you know, once you make the decision to share it in book form, you really have to submit to the conventions of, of the form. Um, and so I think, you know, it's something that other memoirists deal with as well and maybe feel a little, you know, inner tension or conflict about because you are, it is your life. It's very serious stuff. Um, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want just to be salacious for its own sake when it's, you know, your wife. <laughs> um, at the same time, you are telling a story. And, you know, I could have written about our lives in a million different ways. The way I chose was one that I thought would get people turning the pages. And that's just, uh, that's the nature of it. Yeah, well, it's definitely, I mean, however, I don't know how much you thought about how to do it but it just works fantastically my friend it really does it's an incredible read and it i can think if it was put together a different way like if it hadn't had the mixing of your eight marathons and eight weeks things it might have been even a book where people think you know what's this too heavy for me i'm just getting a bit you know it could have gone either way if you if you'd have changed it but the actual way it has been put together for me anyway i'm sure a lot of other people i've spoken to it just really it works it really works um I noticed during the book, there's quite a few times where you mentioned like the police nearly shooting Nataki. And there's another one as well. Uh, I think it was with regards to Nataki getting released from one of her trips to the psychiatric hospitals and that. And she was just released with no money. Um, and you were just amazed at that. There's a few occasions like that. Did you, do you still feel that there is a, a lack of support? yourself and people like Nataki in the system with regards to the police and the health system? Is there something you feel that you need to highlight and improve? Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, you know, a, a couple of centuries ago, they had uh, what were known as ships of fools, where people with mental, you know, the term mental illness didn't exist then, but they, they would take people who had mental illnesses, put them on a boat and send it off into the ocean. Uh, good luck to you. And we honestly haven't come that far. <laughs> you know, it's better now, especially, you know, with some of the pharm pharmaceuticals um, give people a foundation. You know, they're not the answer or they're not a complete answer or a complete solution. Um, but, you know, so part of me thinks, thank goodness we weren't having to deal with this, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. At the same time, we have so far to go. I mean, the police are should not be your first point of contact when you're having a, a mental health crisis. Um, it shouldn't be their job. So, you know, you see a lot of in incompetence, uh, you know, on the behalf of or on the part of law enforcement in the book. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't blame them because I understand that they're they're doing a job that they weren't really, you know, ever intended to have to, to do. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's interesting whether you, yeah, there's some shocking moments in there. Uh, I think yeah, even things like uh, there's one where she gets the wrong prescription. So it's, it. yeah. you know, it's, it's the, it's the hospitals, it's uh, law enforcement, it's even, you know, the pharmacies, you know, we, we ended up in a terrible place just because Nataki had been given some other woman's medication. Uh, yeah, shocking. it was shocking. It really was. And then it seems like you paint a picture in the book that the the only reason that you've got to where you are now was because you seem to stumble upon somebody who suddenly came up with a different solution and gave the found the winning combination of drugs, whatever, to actually settle it down and you know take it forwards. Was it kind of luck that you stumbled upon this person, or just a matter of time before you find the doctor with the right angle? Yeah, I mean, you know, when when people ask, you know, how did how did you get to the other side of it? You know, because Nataki was hospitalized seven times. The last time was uh, almost exactly six years ago. Um, so we feel like we have come out. I mean, she still has the disease, but she's doing well and, and has been for a while. But there was a long stretch there when it just, we saw no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and so when people ask, well, how did you get there? The only answer I can really come up with is that we, we kept getting up <laughs> each time we were knocked down. It's not like we figured something out or had a great epiphany. Um, and I, I think I, my understanding is that this is sort of a common story that 
it, it does take a while because, um, you know, individual, you know, chemistry is, is different. You know, people respond differently to different drugs, but that we just, you know, there was a, there was a solution out there. We didn't know it, but we just needed to stay in the game long enough to eventually find it. And that's what happened. Other things matter too. You know, Nataki, she doesn't work. She can't, she needs to keep stress out of her life. Exercise helps, diet helps. Um, how our communication between us matters a lot. Um, and so there's a lot of pieces, but as I indicated earlier, the drugs are kind of, they give you a foothold because all that other stuff isn't going to help you if you're just simply not yourself uh, in your head. And a sense of humor. I saw one of your tweets that kind of suggested that that kind of helps you manage to, which I totally understand with all the mayhem and craziness. If you can both at times find time to laugh, that must just really help. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, humor is very important in my life. You know, when I was a much younger writer, I, I, I wrote, for laughs almost exclusively. I just kind of, I'm slumming it in this whole running writing thing. But uh, so I have a sense of humor, you know, people see it in my everyday life. So with with this book, it just felt natural because yes, Nataki has a sense of humor uh, as well. And it just, you know, this might be not the, <laughs> not quite the right way to say it, but it keeps you sane, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we would, we would have laughs, you know, very close on the heels of some of our uh, darkest moments and it, you know, it helped, <laughs> it, it does help. So, you know, the humor you see in the book is it's very close to how we just experienced it ourselves when you would have trauma one moment and you'd be laughing the next that, that was, that was the life we, we, we were living. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, um, yeah, well, I need people to pick up this book and read it because there's so much to it. I'm hoping what we've talked about so far has given people an idea and made them inquisitive, but there's so many benefits for people to read from it um, from so many different walks of life, so many reasons. Um, like you've said, the other half of the book kind of is about your challenge, again, to stop yourself from thinking you're a coward of running eight marathons in eight weeks, getting to know loads of other people. And you draw some wonderful characters you meet along the way, all kind of along the line that life is a marathon for everyone, everyone kind of struggling with certain things or reasons why they're into endurance running. Which of those characters, I'm, I'm sure they all stay in your mind, but is there anyone in particular who you kind of think of, who you met along the way, who you think kind of sums up wonderfully the message behind the book? Yeah, probably uh, James uh, from from Kansas. Um, you know, when I'm some some people I meet and I I just can't wait to write about them. Uh, and and James is one of those people. He uh, just was a very unique character. He's the kind of person who, as soon as you like look in his eyes and hear him talk, you're like you're different. Um, and you know, so I got a chance to to spend a little time with him. This is a, a a trail marathon in rural Kansas uh, that I ran in just atrocious conditions. Um, and it ended up being a 30 mile marathon for me because I got lost. But yeah, James, he just shows up just, uh, he had clearly slept in this purple car that that looked like a, a, a flying saucer in <laughs> this little purple. He shows up in this thing, gets out, and you could tell he'd slept in it. Uh, his hair is just like a, a rat's nest. and. Uh, I'm like, I want to meet this guy. Um, and I'm really an introvert. So, but on this trip, I was going out of my way to, to meet people. And um, he, he had had a tough life. His, his, his mother had bipolar disorder and he sort of grew up as a semi orphan. His father died when he was just a year old. And so it took him a while to open up. This is one of those cases where I went first and then he felt comfortable sharing, even though we just met. Um, and he came to running very late. Um, it's funny, he, he, he grew up without, he grew up very isolated, not trusting people you know, in school. He was, other kids thought he was weird. Um, and then he discovers running. He, he's really into like the obstacle races and, and the ultras. Um, and he just, he just, he discovered this community. And it's almost like he became a different person once he had, you know, it was a, a you know, a passion that led to a community. Um, and yeah, he was just, he was from, uh, uh, South Carolina, I think, but he was traveling all around America, just like 
similar to what I was doing, um, just meeting people and having experiences. And, and it was, you know, running had just given him a, a brand new life that he was really in, enjoying. Um, yeah, an eccentric guy, but, but I liked him a lot. I'll never forget him. Yeah, a wonderful chap, a wonderful story. And there's, and there's, it seems like all of them deserve a mention, but um, thinking off the top of my head, I remember there was, what was, is it uh, Rome, the five foot two guy? Yeah, Still Rome. My mind. That was, tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so uh, Rome, um, I met him at the Boston Marathon. I was signing books at the expo a couple of days before the race, and he just, he recognized me. Um, he apologized later because he just got talking and he didn't actually get a signed book. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you ended up in my book. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so he, he had qualified to, for Boston for the first time after 20 years of trying. Uh, so there's a story right there. Right. Um, but again, like once you, it, you know, that's just the surface. Like once you get talking to someone like him, you realize, you know, it's not just about running. It, it goes real deep. And, uh, so he'd grown up in the Seattle area, was always undersized. You know, he's in the, I think, the first percentile for height for, for American males. So he's shorter than every guy he ever meets and, and was his entire life. And, you know, that affects you. Um, you know, I'm tall, so it's not something I ever really thought about. But when he, when he talked about his experiences, I'm, I thought, yeah, I, I get that. You know, people would assume that he just wasn't an athlete because he was short, which wasn't true. He was athletic. And you know, he, he wouldn't necessarily have the same opportunities with, with girls, um, you know, because of his height, you know, it, it affected his confidence and, and running became this um, symbolic way of sort of proving that, you know, just because he was small of stature, it didn't mean anything else about him. You know, he, um, but, it, but he, he was self-sabotaging because, you know, the psychology was wired in where he was, he was sort of afraid of success just based on you know how he'd grown up as a as a shorter person, so it took him. It was a long road towards self discovery, sort of realizing that the only reason he hadn't qualified for Boston was because he hadn't done what he needed to do to qualify for Boston. You know, so um, so then he this you know this finally late. He's about my age. It was mid forties. He finally just made a commitment. He, 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 you know, his attitude was. I'm going to get there or die trying and it made all the difference and 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 he got there yeah it's brilliant there's another wonderful example and there's more um it's like i say the two run so well together and and i've heard you kind of say that it was your passion and and your ability to do endurance running which got you through the struggles in life i can't help thinking that ironically it was actually your inability to continue with your kind of potential national level running which gave you the strength and the desire to actually stick with the whole relationship problem so it was thanks to your inability to deal with the demands of running which gave you that impetus to help Ataki. so it's really the fact that you can't be a 100 percent runner which allowed you to tell this story isn't it yeah yeah that's uh that that's incisive but, but i mean i think it's true um yeah uh you know for me running was about yeah i'm competitive like i care about time and place and, and stuff like that but for me i wanted to use running to become a different man you know to become the man i envisioned myself being um and i have to give myself some credit some people just don't care you know like they're <laughs> They're like, I'm perfect just the way I am. That wasn't me. I was far from the person I wanted to be, but I was willing. I wasn't content to, to be who I was. And I think that drive is what did set me up. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in my role as Nataki's husband and caregiver. You see me making those mistakes in the book. Um, but I, wa you know, I wasn't going to quit on her. Um, and I think it's exactly for, for the reason uh, you say. The blessing to balance the curse is the way I think you poetically put it, which is like one of the many just nail biting kind of ways you put these things through. Um, so just because you do seem to give yourself such a hard time throughout the book, do you still regard yourself as a coward? 
No, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm not a finished product, and you know, one of the things I like about you know not being dead yet is that you you know you keep changing. You, you know, no matter you know, you have moments where you discover something about yourself, and it gives you the power to take a step forward in your growth process. But then you know, a month or two or six months later, you have another moment like that, and you're like, well, thank goodness I didn't die six months ago because I'm you know I'm still growing. So that's how I, I see myself now. You know, I, I married the right person. We're very different, but I really look up to Nataki. You know, she, she, she is strong in ways that I'm not, uh, at least not by nature. Um, so, you know, I'm every day I'm under the same roof with someone who, you know, is sort of a role model to me. Again, it's not about, we'll never be that much alike, but I feel like she sort of shows, demonstrates the path forward uh, for me, like some of the standards she holds herself to. So, you know, I think, you know, the journey continues. Oh, without a doubt, no, definitely. The happiest moment for me in the book, I don't know if anyone else has picked up on this or feared the same thing, but I was like literally sat up in bed, wife's asleep and I'm getting podcast time. And I'm like, no, because there's some, and I don't know whether it's the audible or reading, but there's a time where you are kind of locked for self-protection in the bathroom and the talkie is thumping on the door and then it, I think it goes quiet and then I'm listening to this story and it says you could smell the burning of fur or something or hair I'm thinking Queenie I'm mm -hmm. thinking the dog and I don't know whether that was just my imagination going crazy but I thought you know what if it turns out that she's set on fire to the dog I might be turning this off very quickly <laughs> <laughs> And when I found out it was just a sheepskin blanket, I actually woke my wife up because so I went, oh, thank God for that. Like, what, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, oh, oh, don't worry. It's too long a story. Go back to sleep. But am I the first person to fear that? Or do you, looking back, do you realize that that was something that people were fearing when you said I could smell burning hair? Well, when I was in that, you know, you know, I was, it's just a water closet. I mean, it's the size of a closet. There's just a, a toilet and a window and me in there. And you know, I smell burning and, you know, I mean, I'm on the phone with the uh, police dispatcher. I'm, you know, Nataki is pounding on the, this door with just like superhuman force. Like I'm leaning against it, trying to keep it shut. At one point the phone falls out of my hand and I think it's going to go into the toilet. Um, it's just, you know, terrifying, terrifying. And you might be thinking, oh, you know, well, she's a woman and you're a man. But when, when Nataki had these psychotic breaks, she, she could, do some damage, you know? And also I, I learned I can't fight back. So that I, di I didn't have, I didn't want to go to jail again. Um, and, and so it was, it was, I was in a pickle. Um, but then, you know, then I smell burning and I, it does smell organic, you know, it does, it, it smells like hair. So I don't know, it, it could have been Queenie as, as far as I knew, you know, thank God it, it wasn't, but you know, I didn't know. And by that point I had gotten used to the idea that I might, not live through one of these events. So, I mean, I wanted to live through the event, but I was also concerned about other things and, and Queenie was one of them. Um, you know, my, my, my thought was that, that the house was on fire and I might, you know, burn alive inside it. And I, I say in the book, I mean, I, I thought this at the time, I hope at least she took Queenie. Uh, I mean, she's a dog, but she's the closest thing we have to a child. We, both love this dog a lot. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was just hoping for 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 that much. <laughs> yeah, we'll be all Jesus. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, how old is Queenie now? She's uh she's thirteen. Um, so yeah, she's she's still with us. Uh, pretty healthy for her age, but that that's old for a dog. We're not gonna not gonna have her forever. No, fantastic. Right. Well, look. Um, time is growing against us for a while what are you up to at the moment what um putting all life as a, i'm sure you're still talking to many people who want to know about life as a marathon but you're very big still with the coaching that's taken off more than you expected yeah um it, it has um you know many years ago the, the i don't know if people are familiar with the online platform training peaks but um i know some of the guys who started that company um and way back we're going to 2006 they um they asked me to create the first training plans that were downloadable from a website to a device. 
And I usually say yes to every opportunity because I've just learned that you, you never know what's going to work. Um, my baseball metaphor for it is swinging at every pitch. Um, so, you know, writing is my, my first passion, but I do love coaching athletes a, as well. And this thing, because training peaks took off and because I developed a reputation through my writing, this little side business took off. And so now we're coming up on 14 years down the road and it's grown into this operation, uh, more and more time consuming operation called 8020 Endurance, which is you know, it's just an online training platform for uh, endurance athletes, runners, triathletes, and soon cyclists. Fantastic, yeah. And of course, yeah, it's worth pointing out. I mean, I'm, for me and swimming just don't mix, but the 8020 running was followed up, I think the same year or the next year with the 8020 for triathletes. So, um, you have, do you have just as many triathletes as runners, or is it split 50 50, or what do you think? That works? Ooh, my business partner would have to answer that question, but it's, you know, there, there are more runners out there, but triathletes are more likely to spend money on, on a, a, you know, a training plan. Um, so it, it's probably reasonably close to a 50 50 split. Definitely in the UK, a lot of people, well, probably started a few years ago, but moved away from the mouth and being the pinnacle mm -hmm. of conquering things to realizing there's other things out there you can do to feel good especially people who are doing marathons in six seven eight hours there were as a therapist i remember i'd see these people the next day and they come and lie on the couch and they look the most unhappiest people in the world even though they'd finished it they go yeah but i didn't write it i don't deserve the medal I'm like why did you put yourself through 12 13 you know weeks of training and now you're not even happy with what you did and i think thankfully um, these people moved and they're excelling at kind of shorter distance triathlons with some cycling and swing they weren't designed it's like you said in the book not everyone's born to run which incidentally i'm not sure whether that was a dig at the kind of book or not or just a off the cuff remark where you say obviously not all people are born to run no i mean you know that expression has been around a lot longer than than, than that book yes <laughs> i think of the book as well i'm confused now <laughs> that's a double dig very clever <laughs> uh, no connection fine um well look it's 8 58 um i wish i could talk to you for another hour but i'm sure you've got things to do it's only what time is it four o'clock in the afternoon where you on? well i'm on i'm in california so we're coming up on one o'clock in the afternoon here oh, yeah i also got my times completely wrong so i was putting esd to you you're just being polite and going i'm not even in here yeah I, I i'm i'm fluent in american time zones so i can Translate. Is California and now at the moment? Sort of north central. So I'm um, same latitude as San Francisco and Yosemite National Park, but kind of halfway between the two. Okay. I was in Orange County for about a month and a half a uh, while back. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. It was a nice taste of California and Santa Monica, but that's further south, isn't it? So, um, yeah. Thank you so much again uh, for what is a fantastic book. I hope you and Natalia are getting enormously positive feedback for just being so honest and sharing so much of your lives um especially nataki i don't know whether she's there or listening or whether she listens to this but thank you she, i think she, i have the door closed because our, our house cleaners happen to be here of course that's how it worked out running vacuum cleaners but i think she overheard at least some of the conversation oh well, I, I hope so i hope um, she realizes i'm just one person but if anyone feels as much as I did for the gratitude for her sharing this, I mean, she is the star of the film. Um, and it's thanks to her agreeing for you to tell her story that I think it's going to touch so many people in so many different ways. So do thank her. And you, of course. Um, and um, I look forward to your next. In May, you said it's coming out. Wasn't it originally Running the Dream? Or something? How did that change? What was that meeting like? It was the, it was the running bum originally. Uh, I don't know, you know, we have that, the concept of like ski bums and surf bums. And I wanted, you know, I thought of myself as a running bum because I wasn't a professional runner, but I was living like one. Um, but the publisher thought, well, there's negative associations with bums or, well, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I like their title. Actually, it is theirs. Do you, do you ever, you do a lot of talks in the States. Do you come out to the States at all? Have you traveled to do presentations and yeah, um, I do. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling that ever since Alex Hutchinson made it big, he's getting a lot of my, the gigs I used to get because I haven't, I, I was, uh, 
I was in uh, Bulgaria and Costa Rica last year. Um, but in 2019, all the speaking I did was in, in the States, but shoot, all I need is an invitation, man. I'm, I love to travel. <laughs> it would be, yeah. I mean, yeah, just taking it off my head, but the, the running conference is definitely going to happen. The idea is international. So if you're around free November, late October next year, around Halloween, then yeah, the invitation will definitely be there. Uh, and hopefully I'll bring you to meet people and shake hands with people that you've known about and haven't actually met a person before. Um, that would be amazing. Oh, we'll talk more later on. All right, dude. Well, thank you so much. It's been such oh, good. Thank you. thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to put you back down to the lobby and then I'll come down in a couple of minutes to say goodbye officially. I'm just going to say goodbye to people listening to the podcast as well. Is that okay? I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, what a fantastic hour um, with um the inspirational matt fitzgerald and his partner nataki as well i really do sincerely wish um the best to the both of them and thank them so much for the journey which um they take us through and open up um through the book life's a marathon um apologies for the sound problems during that recording um it's my fault entirely um as you can probably see from the background here because i was recorded on a thursday evening um i set up a slightly different rig downstairs and uh yeah it didn't really work so i've done everything i could to correct the sound take out the echo um and to equalize it a little bit it's been ages uh, but it's very substandard i do apologize for that i promise you in future we'll return to um the better sound consistency which we're used to here on one chat live um so yeah and i think i'll record in the evenings from here and just if the kids wake up you might hear a bit of screaming but there we go so yes so there we go what an opener to um one chat live season one uh like i say it still be um uploaded uh to spotify and to all the other um itunes and as episode 37 and to acast to pocket cast to any wherever you like listen to it it will be available in a few days time and um, we also send it up to youtube as well uh, but it will be down as episode 37 even though it's the start of a new season the next guest, well, you will have to follow us, as always, on social media. We're very active on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So there will be news coming up soon of who the next speaker is going to be. We've got some very, very exciting guests coming up um, over the course of the next 11 months or so. And like I said earlier on, um, if you can, put aside now... Uh, end of October to 2020, because um, there will be RCL International Conference uh, 2020, where there will be 10 international speakers put together to um, share with you their wisdom. Um, and yeah, put it aside. Like I say, I might try and do a weekend version of it as well for people who can't get time off work. Uh, that was one of the feedbacks I got um, from the uh, conference itself. Um, keep that feedback coming in now and again people are still coming through with the ideas anything any format i want a format that suits therapists and runners which is a bit of a challenge um, we had some very useful feedback from runners and from therapists who attended uh, but often it kind of contradicts with each other so I'm, I'm chatting with a few people to see what we can do about that um, i do like the idea of therapists and runners being in the same room together for two days and i do like the idea of the speakers um presenting something which can be understood and appreciated and benefit both therapists and runners. Um, I want the question time to be actual dialogue between runners and therapists. I want that um, relationship to be improved because I think because of traditional therapy, most runners run like the wind away from any therapist because they just think they're going to be signed up to a package of six sessions, whatever it is, um, and then they probably will feel just as bad afterwards. Unfortunately, it's one of the repercussions of, of of traditional therapy, which is not really, there's a lot of mistakes in it, which is what One Check Live is all about. But anyway, in the meantime, if you've enjoyed um, the beginning of this new season, then do please spread the word, spread the news of Matt Fitzgerald's book, and do spread the word of Run Chat Live. Um, we're beginning to get through now into the running groups. Um, we're beginning to not have posts taken down because people are realizing that 
what myself and guests put out on this podcast is one it's free we're not making any money out of it and two um, it's quality research backed evidence we're not going to tell you anything which is not evidence backed and if it does lack a bit in the evidence then we'll make it clear um, and that's where the way it's got to be when we're talking about health um, and uh, avoiding injury or reducing the risk of injury and improving performance so there we go hope you enjoyed yourselves um we'll be back um in approximately three or four weeks time but like i say keep your eyes out on social media and thank you very much for sticking with us you're listening to run chat live podcast putting the evidence back into running injury and performance